So thank you for joining us on our Wednesday, December 16th, 2020 edition of our prayer study. And, and as you know, that means we just have 15 more days to go for 2020. I can hear all the cheering already, so uh, we can celebrate. Today, and this day in history, some unique things. 1653, Oliver Cromwell was appointed the Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland. In 1707, the last recorded eruption of Mount Fuji in Japan. 1773, didn't we all love the Boston Tea Party? So that was pretty cool. 1913, Charlie Chaplin begins his film career. He was paid $150 a week in 1913. That was big money. In 1951, the NBC station started premiering Dragnet for the first time, but I, I saved this one for last because it's huge. The 1944, today was the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, mm -hmm. which uh, really, really significant. Germany attacking, they thought they were surprise attacking. Eventually we were able to fight them back. But here in our church, there were several men, several of our men who participated in that. And so that's really significant to us. Some birthdays, born in 1714, George Whitfield, born in uh, England. Uh, my favorite George Whitfield story, he was an evangelist, a preacher. Uh, when he came to the United States, him and uh, John Wesley were really um, contemporaries and, and reaching America, great ministry. But they both had different theological schools of thought. And back then, nothing going on, they didn't have presidential things and pandemics to talk about. So the local newspapers were always looking for stories. Someone was following Whitfield around on one of his religious uh, evangelistic campaigns and they asked him if he thought he would see Wesley in heaven. And supposedly he said no. And the scribe was ready to write furiously until Whitfield explained that's because Wesley uh, will be sitting at the feet of Jesus, and I will be so far back in the crowd I won't be able to see him. What a great, humble, uh, godly spirit he had. 1770, you may have heard of Ludwig von Beethoven was born on this date then. Some uh, deaths that took place on this date, 1859, Wilhelm Grimm, the German writer who wrote the Grimm's fairy tales, was um, passed away on this date. He was 73 years old. And of course, who doesn't remember 1980 when Colonel Harlan Sanders, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, who was not anything of a military officer, but he was 90 years old when he passed away. So just a couple important things on this date in history. And even more important to you and I, we're talking about 1 John, and we're in chapter 1, and we're talking about um, prayer, obviously. Last week, we talked a little bit about the, um, the prayer with the triunity of God, how we could have fellowship and prayer with God. And that comes, of course, after we have salvation. After we know Christ as Savior, then we can fellowship with God because we're brought into his family. And that fellowship has to come after the confession of sin. So if we want to have daily fellowship with God, there's got to be confession of sin. By the way, that's what Jesus was picturing in John chapter 13. You might remember that uh, Jesus went around the room and washed the feet of his disciples. When you and I live this life, just like they did, and just walking around in this world, we are defiled by the world. We may not want to be impacted by them, but we are. If you ever went to the beach, just go to the beach for a minute. Drive up, walk down, hand somebody something, and come back. And then you get back and your sandals and your toes, everything's all sandy. And you gotta wash that off. You don't need a complete shower. Um, that's what Jesus told Peter. You don't need all that because you're in the family. You don't need a full bath, you are saved. You just need the cleansing of the feet. The, we just need the cleansing of our soul for fellowship with Christ. Um, we need that. And Jesus even said to Peter, if you don't do that, if you're not confessing sin and you're not cleansing your soul for fellowship, then you will have no part with me. 
It's pretty significant. So confession is really important. Here's verses 8, 9, and 10 of 1 John 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. I'm going to go to verse 1 of chapter 2, where it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Strangely, uh, supposedly there's some people who really believe that they either don't have a sin nature or they've never sinned even. That's crazy. Verse 8 talks about those who say that they don't sin, they don't have a sin nature. And verse 10 talks about those who say they have never sinned. I remember when I was young, my father used to say something like this, that he thought he did something wrong once, but he was mistaken. And that's pretty funny, but I'm glad that he finally came to the point where he understood Romans 3.23, where it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone. Psalm 14, 1 through 3 says, No one is without sin. So read it. It's, it's right there. It'd be interesting, and this is what we're going to do, it'd be interesting to parallel verse 8 and verse 10 and take those phrases one at a time Here's how we go. Verse 8 would say, if we say that we have no sin. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned. Verse 8, we deceive ourselves. Verse 10, we make him a liar. Verse 8, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, and his word is not in us. Do you see what it's saying? We, uh, we're really deceived if we think that sin has not affected us. And, and infiltrated our hearts and minds, and sin separates us from God. Even those of us who trusted Christ and were forgiven and the blood of Christ has cleansed us, we still have to have that fellowship with God. Verse 8 is kind of saying to us um, that we have no sin, and that's not talking about the act of sin, that's about the nature, the principle, the root of sin and our sin nature. Verse 10 does speak about the act of sin. That's really thinking more there. Aren't you so glad? I mean, what would we do without verse 9? Uh, aren't we so thankful that John put that in there for us as well? He says, if we confess our sins. Now, by the way, he doesn't give us how to do that. He doesn't tell us a method of how to confess. He just says, do it. Just do it. If we confess our sins, here's what happens. Jesus forgives, and he purifies us. He forgives because he is faithful, and he is just. He's faithful. It means he completes what he begins. It means he's going to guard those who trust in him. He's trustworthy. And he's also just. He's righteous. His truth is passing into action. His righteousness is is completely fulfilled in Christ. So he does forgive because he's faithful, because he's just, but he also purifies us. He doesn't just take care of the past and let us go. He purifies us, cleanses us, purges us from our sin, and all that is through the blood of Christ. And by the way, verse 9 also just doesn't just say, oh, he took care of it, took care of that sin for me. It says it's from all sin. All of it. All sin. It does not matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you have thought in the past or done in the past. It's all forgiven. It's all forgiven. And if God can forgive you, can't you forgive yourself as well? All that sin is gone, so we can have fellowship with God. And it told us earlier in verse 5 that in God, in Him, there is no darkness at all. None. And if there's no darkness in, in him, he doesn't want darkness in us. So to have fellowship with him, we have to come through the blood of Christ. His forgiveness is decisive, and he remembers the sin no more. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, For I will forgive your wickednesses, 
and will remember their sins no more. Psalm 103, 12, you might remember, says, As far as the east from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. So you go to chapter 2 and verse 1. It's really a complete thought there. And it, he's talking to us, and he says that he writes this to you so that you will not sin. That literally means that you will not sin at all. Never sin, not once. That's what John is writing. He doesn't want you to ever have sin, ever. Then he says, but since, now I know your translation says if, and don't get technical, but it is a technical Greek phrase that really should be translated since. But since we do sin, you know, walking with God does not mean that we're going to be without sin. It doesn't mean we're going to be without temptation. It's our nature to sin. It's going to happen. And since it does sin, what does he have? We have an advocate, a defense, a defense attorney, a mediator, one called alongside, a helper. The literal Greek word is the paraclete, and I know that's used for the Holy Spirit most of the time, but the paraclete is just someone who is going to come alongside and help. Satan's the accuser. He accuses us, and he has every right. He could go to the throne of God and say, did you see what Pastor Bud did? Did you see his attitude? Did you hear what he was thinking? He'd be right. He'd be right. But Jesus steps up and says, no, wait a minute. I have a cause here, and I'm going to object to this accusation on the grounds that this is a family matter, and he's in my family. I'll take care of that. So Satan is gone with that. Jesus bore our payment. We're in his family. He is our advocate. He covers us with his blood. We need to confess to him. If we want to have that intimacy, that fellowship with him, we have to fess up to who we are and what we've done. But he welcomes that. You know, a lot of times when you do something wrong to somebody, even if they're saying you're saying they're sorry, they don't accept that. They're mad and they don't like it. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus welcomes us back every single time. And you can say, but I've done it so much. It's repeated. It's, he's got to be tired of me. No, he's not. He loves you. He forgives you. And he wants to fellowship with you. What a wonderful, graceful God we have. Let's pray to him. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness to us in forgiving us, even when we fail miserably, fail repeatedly, you still love us and welcome us to your fellowship again. Lord, thank you. That's such a great reminder. We do sin, we do fail, but you are our advocate and you are our helper. So Lord, uh, not only forgive us, but help us to transcend the temptations that we have, that we can have victory in that and bring glory to your name. Lord, we just commit our hearts and lives to you to bring honor to your name. In Christ we pray, amen.